Would you turn in your Bibles with me, please, to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to zero in on verses 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to talk just about a subject that absolutely every one of you is just going to absolutely love. It's such a blessing. We're going to talk about discipline. Not discipline in eating, not discipline in running or exercising. Corrective discipline. I know that just sends a tingle down your spine, doesn't it? Let's look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just the first two verses of this chapter that we're going to spend a good chunk of the summer just really dissecting. And then a, another chapter over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. This, this morning, just the first two verses, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And of a kind, listen to this, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. Think about that for a minute. Verse 2. No, wait, 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 wait. Even among pagans. A man, a man has his father's wife, his, step, his stepmother. Verse 2. Now we're ready for verse 2. And, Paul says, you are proud with an exclamation point. You are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship? Listen to this. This sounds so extreme. And put out of your fellowship the man who did this. Just a real uplifting verse, isn't it? When godly people do ungodly things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is, a, this is a tough series, a little bit of a tough series. But, Father, I believe there's a lot that pe can be gleaned from this chapter and this chapter over in 2 Corinthians. A lot can be gained through spiritual discipline and correction. Father, I'm asking... I'm asking that your divine timing is at work, even in this series. That way back several months ago when you first laid this on my heart, that you would know that at this moment in time, this first Sunday of, Jan of June, somebody would be struggling with crossing the line. Let this be an intervention before that happens. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said. How many of you are parents? Grandparents? Parents and grandparents? So you know, you know what discipline's all about, right? And it's got to be one of the hardest jobs of parenting is correcting your kids, right? It's, it's hard work to be consistent, to do it out of love and not out of anger. You know, it can be a really, really tough job. It'd be so much easier sometimes just to, you know, push it under the carpet or, or look the other way and pretend that it doesn't happen. But if you do that, you know as parents and as grandparents, you'll pay the price down the road, won't you? You'll pay the price. You'll have a hell on wheels down the road. So you, you got to almost pay the price now so you can have have the payday down the road. Just because we grow up, just because we walk across a platform and receive a high school diploma or a college degree doesn't stop us from needing discipline. You know what the Bible says? For all have sinned. Right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means we all need discipline. I have stated many times through the years, the most dangerous place a Christian can live is at a place of low accountability. Preachers included. 
because we have blind spots. We all sin. And there is need for corrective discipline. And, and guys, you know, you know as parents and grandparents, but you know in your own walk, there are some lessons to be gleaned. There's some spiritual growth to be had in those moments of discipline that are more uh, available to us than in any time when we're walking through the tulips and everything's going good spiritually. Can I get a witness on that? There's some huge lessons. That is what's happening in this verse. Some sin has risen up in the church, not in the city, in the church of Corinth. And Paul is bringing his discipline to it because, because the sin that has rose, risen up, they're blowing it. They're not addressing it. In fact, they're exactly the opposite. So Paul's coming in, which Paul can do. Paul's got a gift in this area. And he's just nailing them, nailing them. And, and because of it, they're going to have an opportunity for spiritual growth like they've never had before. And as, especially in these first two verses, as Paul identifies and confronts this sin, there's some tremendous lessons about sin that we can learn because of Paul's faithfulness to correct. Are you with me this morning? You all right? Let's jump in real quick. Lesson number one, we can see from this con confrontation of sin, we can see the report of sin. Write that down, the report of sin. I want you to look at the first four words in verse one, where it says in the NIV, it says, it is actually what? It is actually what? Reported. One, one verse in the Bible, in, in Numbers 32, 23, says, Be sure your sins will what? Will find you out. Your sins will be reported. In Galatians 6, 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Whatever is underneath there, it's going to come up. It's going to come up. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 8, the Lord talks about uh, an idol. He calls it the idol that provokes to jealousy. It's back in the Old Testament in Ezekiel. And it has shown up at the temple. And it starts at the gate, at the front gate of the temple. And he, and he takes the Ezekiel and says, See, see this idol that provokes me to jealousy? It's right there at the entrance of the temple. But then as you go on into the verse, it moves to the inside of the temple, into the inner corridors. And then this idol that provokes to jealousy goes behind closed doors. And where, they, where it says, you'll see it here in a minute, it says, the, the elders of the church, they don't think I see, they don't think I see it. And then this idol keeps moving in the temple until it gets behind the portico and the altar, which have, you've heard the term, the holy of holies, the most sacred holy place in all of Israel. And they've set up an idol that provokes jealousy. Look at verse 7 of Ezekiel chapter 8. I want you to hear how many times, as the Lord speaks to Ezekiel, how many times he uses the word see. Do you see? Listen to this in verse 7. Then he took, God took Ezekiel to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, do now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and I saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. Verse 12. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the what? The what? The what? Elders. Leaders of the church. Not pagans. Do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of his own idol. They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Then he said again, you will see them do things that are even more detestable than this. Godly people, elders, doing ungodly things. I remember uh, Chuck Colson, he just passed away not too long ago, leading, leading guy in the whole Watergate thing. He made a statement. He was a big part of the cover-up of Watergate back in the 70s. And that's before some of your time. But he said this. Watergate emboiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. 
Now listen to this. Twelve of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie together for three weeks. What you sow is what you will reap. Whatever line you're considering to cross, that will be manifested. I remember a brother, I was playing golf with him over Blue Hills, and we were talking, and, and he was saved in an early age. And one of the things he loved, he wasn't addicted, he wasn't an alcoholic, but he loved beer. He loved beer. And the Lord convicted him of it. And so he made a vow when he got saved, he wasn't going to touch any more beer. But that craving was still there. And uh, several weeks he was growing, he was, he was doing wonderful. He, he was a truck driver, and it was a Friday night, he was coming back to Roanoke, and it was snowing, and you Southerners know how you respond to snow, right? I mean, you, you act like they're tornado warnings. And, and it was snowing, so nobody's out, nobody's out. He's 50 miles away from Roanoke, give me a break. He's sitting at a truck stop, and he says, I'm going to have a beer. I mean, what's going to hurt? Who's going to see? Who's going to know? This is no joke. He, he shared it with me himself on the, on the golf course. He orders this beer, and, and the waitress brings it as he's bringing it to his mouth, 50 miles away from Roanoke on a snowy night. As he's bringing it up, the door opens. You know who walks in? His pastor. <laughs> 50 miles away on a snowy night, Friday night, his pastor walks in while he's bringing it up to his mouth. Be sure your sins will find you out. Can I get a witness on that? Number two, the second lesson we learned, we see the revelation of sin. Write that down. We see the revelation of sin. In the, in the next phrase of verse 1, it says that there is sexual immorality among you. Isn't it just like the Lord? Isn't it just like the Lord to take his finger and his convicting finger of the Holy Spirit and he says, your problem is right. Bingo! Right there. That's it. There's not a person in this room who's a Christian. Holy Spirit hadn't done that to. Can I get a witness on that? You got a problem, and it's right, bingo, right there, and he names it, right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's one of the benefits of spiritual discipline, where the Lord, often through other people, will come in and say, you got a problem right there, man. You got an issue. You better see it, because we all have blind spots. You know, I shared with you several, several uh, years ago, it's a little embarrassing, but I developed a little bit of a problem, a bit of a swelling, a little bit of a cancer scare uh, where the sun doesn't shine. You know what I mean by that? A little, little delicate. And they sent me for some tests. And you know when, when women are pregnant and they have this thing that they scan over their tummy? Well, that's what they sent me to, but it wasn't my tummy. And to make matters worse, it wasn't a guy, it was a gal. A gal tech. And, and I, I'm convinced us guys handle this stuff a little, a little worse than you ladies do. You know, the whole medical stuff. And, and so it was awkward, and I'm s sitting there in a very awkward position. And this woman who I've never met is using this scanner to see if I've got a, you know, a medical issue. And, and I'm sitting there so embarrassed and... <laughs> And, at the, I mean, it's going on for 45 minutes, right? And finally, she turns to me and she says, you're going to love me for this. She knows how bothered I am by it. And, I, and this, no, I said it just like this. I said, what? And she says, there's an area I can't get on the scanner. And you got one of two choices. You can either let me call another technician, another woman, to come in and help me, or you will have to start this all over again next week. And I said, bring her in, you know. There's no joke. The door opens. This gal walks in, and she's a young gal who used to play basketball with my daughter. I used to cheer for her. She knows exactly who I am. I know exactly who she is. I'm sitting there with my pants around my ankles. You know, and I, I say, hi, Heather. You know, hi, Pastor John. You know what I mean? And, I mean, it was hell on earth. And, and now I've got two women trying. And she still, after an hour, she can't get it either. So they, at least I don't have to do it all over again next week. So they send me to a pro, a specialist. Not a technician, but to, uh, there's some technicians in this room. 
and I love you to death. And these, these gals, they do it a million times a year, but I don't do it a million times a year, you know what I mean? And so they send me to this specialist, and he's a doctor. And I'm waiting, I'm thinking the worst because of what just happened to me the week before. He comes in, this is no joke. He comes in, you know what he has? A flashlight you can buy at a dime store. He doesn't have a scanner. He doesn't have this multi-million dollar medical machine. He's got a flashlight. And he puts it exactly where he knows to put it turns on the light and in two seconds says, John, you don't have cancer. You have this. And this is what we can do to fix it. And it was a simple uh, surgery and, and it fixed. fixed Because I, I went to the pro. See? You know what a, an advantage, you know what a healing it was to hear the expert say, John, your problem is not this. It's this. That's what we have in the Holy Spirit. Somebody who in discipline comes along and says, your problem is right bingo and names it. This is your issue. Are you with me? That happens usually through people, other people that the Holy Spirit uses and he identifies the problem. Number three, got to keep moving. We see the reproach of sin. Write that down, the reproach of sin. The second half uh, of verse 1, there's this phrase that says, and of a kind that does not occur, listen to this, even among what? Even among what? This sin is of a kind that doesn't even occur among pagans. Now keep in mind, this church is in Corinth. Corinth is one of the most wicked, evil cities in, in the whole region. They practice bestiality. That's sex with animals. They practice sex as a form of entertainment, like we go to the movies. They, their worship, their pagan worship, has prostitutes in the temple. That's the kind of city this church is in. And Paul's coming on and saying, you're worse than that. And he's talking to the church. Man, that's... Do you find that at all convicting? That we could be worse than the godless communities that we live in? One of the biblical scholars made this statement. He said, it shows, this verse shows, that natural, the natural conscience of a non-believer who doesn't even know the Lord can act on a higher moral level than the, than the sheared conscience of a carnal believer. That's possible. And we see it in this example. You know what that means? We all have to guard our hearts. I don't care what your title, I don't care senior pastor, I have to guard every day my heart. I don't care how long you've walked with the Lord, I don't care if you're on the board or not on the board. We have to guard our hearts. There is no place, this side of heaven, the enemy's going to stop hitting on you. So we have to guard our hearts. I've had friends in ministry. I, I had a friend who was the, the uh, chairman of the, of the Department of Religion at the most influential school, my alma mater, of our entire denomination. He was at the same time the pastor of one of the most influential churches in our denomination. He, he had written several best-selling books. He was a tremendous teacher, tremendous communicator. You would have loved to hear from him. He was six months away, probably, from being elected to the highest office our denomination has. Six months away. And he's caught by his own staff at a hotel with one of his secretaries. A gal I grew up with. Her parents and my parents were best friends. Her older brother was my best man at my wedding. And I, th and I see that and I thought, good night. If he falls, if he can't stay clean, what kind of hope is there for the rest of us? We had a year, a couple years back, several years back, where the assistant district superintendent of our area, Virginia, West Virginia, just showed up at the, at the DS's office, dropped his keys on the desk, and walked out. We never saw him again. 
walked away from his wife, walked away from his kids with a woman that he had met in a chat room. Do they have chat rooms anymore on, on computers? Well, that's where he met her and, and ran away with her to Myrtle Beach. So we needed a new assistant DS, right? So we elect a guy who's, whose church is busting. He's, he was growing faster than we were. And, and he comes in to be the replacement for the other guy. Before that year is over, his son walks into his office and catches him in the arms of his secretary. Same year. He runs away. We don't know where he goes for about three days. He's found in a hotel room this close to death by an overdose. They had to pump his stomach. And the other guy who ran away uh, with this woman to Myrtle Beach commits suicide within five years. And these are assistant district superintendents, and I'm thinking, good night! If these guys can't stand, what's the hope for the rest of us? Listen to me. We can live this life that Christ calls us to live. But there's not a person in this room so high up on your spiritual ladder that you don't have to guard your heart every day. And every now and then, when a little bit of discipline comes your way, you better thank God for that discipline. Because somebody loves you enough to keep you out of deep grass. Are you with me this morning? Nobody in this room is at a point that you don't need accountability. Number, write this down, number four. We see the recipients of sin. We see the recipients. In the last phrase of verse one, Paul says, a man has his father's wife. So in other words, Paul doesn't just identify what the sin is, he identifies who the sinner is. And now he doesn't mention it in the text, his name, but you can be sure the church knows who he's, who he's talking about. And he knows who he's talking about. So he not only identifies the sin, he also identifies the sinner. And you think how many times in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, the number of people who tried to conceal their sin, tried to conceal their, their identity. Remember Achan, who stole some of the... Um, uh, the stuff from uh, Jericho. You know, Jericho was the first city to be taken when the, when the Hebrews went into the promised land. So that became, Jericho was the first fruits. Remember when Robert Morris talked about first fruits? Well, Jericho was the first fruit. And so God says, don't take anything from Jericho. That belongs to me. All the other cities you can pillage, but Jericho belongs to me. First fruits. Well, there was one guy who went in, found some gold, stole it, and buried it in his tent. The next battle was a city so small, they didn't even send out the whole army. Remember what happened? They got their tails kicked in. And Joshua said, what in the world is it? We just conquered Jericho. We can't take this little runt city. And he runs to the Lord, and the Lord says, somebody touch what belongs to me. And you remember what they did? They, they took all the tribes and stood them before Joshua. And God said, it's this tribe. So, so then he takes that tribe and has all the clans of that tribe come before him. And God says, it's this clan. And then all the families of that clan stand before him. And God says, it's that family. And so he has all the members of that family come. And the Lord says, it's him. It's Achan. He identifies who he was. And Achan steps up and says, yeah, I did it. And his discipline was they took his life. But Achan's not the only one. Remember David? Remember Cain? Man, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when they tried to hide from God after they, it, they bit the apple. God not only identifies what the sin is, he's not, he's not afraid to identify who the sinner is. Are you with me this morning? What we sow, that is what we will reap. Number five, right? Number five? Wait, before I go there, before I go there, I'm going to do this. The second half of this series goes to 2 Corinthians 7, 12, where Paul comes in after the fact and, and the church cleans itself up and Paul comes in in 2 Corinthians and just praises them. We're going to look at that 
further into the summer, where Paul just praises them for cleaning up their act. But in that, in that, in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 7, verse 12, he, God refers to the Father. He talks about the man who's committed the sin. He talks about the stepmother who's also committing the sin. But in 2 Corinthians, he comes in and he identifies the, the victim of the sin. See, Jesus, Jesus not only sees the villain, he sees the victim. When we sin, we hurt the very people we love the most. And Jesus sees them. It matters to him. The pain we've inflicted in other people. Down the old church, I remember, never forget it. I walked through the front door and I always veered off to the, to the right. Most of you weren't even down there. And because that's where I went to get to my office. And one of the oldest members of our church giant for God, pillar of the faith, met me in the uh, outer vestibule there. We were all by ourselves in a very isolated place. Called me by name and said, man, how you doing? Every time I would address this guy, he would be so positive. But this time he was, I could tell he was burdened. And I said, man, what's wrong? He says, pastor, I need to share something with you that happened a long time ago. And he talked about a, another party, used to be a part of the church, not in my day. He left before I ever showed up. But I heard people talking about this man as, and, and held him up in high esteem. And the guy I was talking to and his wife and the guy that he was talking to me about who had left and his they went out to eat. And the man was in the back seat with this fellow's wife, and he made sure that his wife was in the front seat. And back in that day, they used to put blankets over you when you were traveling, and he groped her, and he fondled her. This man, and this man is in the front seat driving, and the so-called church leader is in the back seat fondling this guy's wife. And for why she let it happen, I do not know. And how long she let it happen, I do not know. But finally, because what you sow is what you reap, it, it came out. And this fella discovered it. He confronted the man several times. I don't know if the man owned it. I don't know if the man apologized for it. I don't know how the man responded. All I know, this fella that was a part of my church, this old man who's probably just a few years from the grave, is still wounded about something that happened 30 years ago. Jesus sees that. There are some of you in this room who are still wounded over something that happened a long time ago. And the thing that broke my heart is this man is a godly man. He should have gone to the grave in peace. And for the most part, I think he did, except for this one scar. Jesus sees the scars of wounded people. That's what discipline brings out. Not just the villain, but the victim. Are we okay? Where am I at? Five. Um, we see the reaction to sin. The first verse, uh, the first phrase of verse two, and you are proud. Unbelievable. You are proud. The, you might ask, how could they possibly be proud? Some of the Bible scholars suggested this man who's in question, he might have been very wealthy, and he might have really helped to underwrite the church financially. He might have been a very powerful man, uh, maybe an influential man in the city. But for some reason, the, the whole church falls in with this guy and instead of being uh, grieved, actually is proud. I mean, I see that today. Sometimes we're proud of the very things we ought to be ashamed of.
Several years ago, um, one of the guys on staff came in, uh, really sharp, 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 good business guy. He was here for about a month. He was, he was just hanging out of the park. And uh, one morning he calls, it's Friday morning, and uh, says, I need to meet with you, I and my wife. Well, I said, shoot, you know, I've been around the barn a few times. I know this isn't good. And so I said, yeah, come on in. And he comes in and he confesses to a lifelong addiction uh, to sexual immorality, not just porn. Porn's bad enough, but I'm talking actually carrying it out with, on several occasions with several different people. And I, you know what I did, guys? I'll confess to you in total trans, trans uh, transparency. Sometimes they just go blank. Um, I, I went into fix-it mode. So how can I fix this? Because I didn't want to lose this guy. Uh, but he, he couldn't continue. I mean, uh, we'd have to try to restore him, you know? But how can I do that and not lose him? So I went to my DS, and I said, look, can I, this is bad. I know it's bad. But can you let me restore him? And I won't let him preach. I won't let him teach. I won't let him marry or bury. I won't let him do communion. Just let him do this business side, and I'll restore him on the side. And the DS says, that's above my pay grade. You're going to have to call the GS. Well, the GS was one of my mentors. This guy, Dr. Haynes, he wrote the Wesleyan Discipline. My grandfather led him to the Lord. The reason he's in ministry is because of my grandpa. So I said, shoot, no problem, you know. And I called him up, this old timer. I said, Dr. Haynes led out the whole thing. He said, will you let me restore him? Let me keep him. I won't let him do this. I won't let him do that. But can he, can he just do the business part? Never forget it. Never forget it. It was on the phone. I even called him at the, at the district office because I didn't want to call him here at the church. And, and Dr. Haynes got on the phone in his slow voice. This is exactly what he says, this old timer. He says, John, I don't think we can do that, can we? <laughs> I'll never forget it. And as soon as it came out of his mouth, John, I don't think we can do that, can we? I knew he was right. I knew it. I needed senior pastor of Parkway Wesleyan. I needed discipline. I needed somebody to hold the line because I was ready to compromise. I was ready for the sake of trying to keep a, some weight off of my own shoulders. I was ready to compromise in this other area and I needed that old man. To hold the line. He didn't turn me over his knee and spank me. But he did gently confront out of love. Say, John, I don't think we can do that, can we? I knew it. I needed that accountability. You need that accountability. I don't care who you are. Because we all have blind spots. Are you with me this morning? And I'm just spreading sunshine all over the place today. What number am I writing? Number six. We see the rebuke for sin. Write that down. We see the rebuke. In the second sentence of verse two, Paul says, he says, you acted like this. You should have acted like this. Sh shouldn't you rather have been filled with what? With what? With grief. Right here, I believe we're getting to the core of this whole series. He's basically saying to the church, you're not responding right. This, you're making the main thing this, and it should be this. You know what gets me here? You know what gets me? Paul's getting more ticked about the church than he is this guy who's doing the sin. He's more ticked about the church than he is this mother-in-law, than his stepmother. That's what he's losing his peace over. It's this church that's not responding right to the sin. Guys, man, that speaks to me these days. 
Because I'm not sure I, I'm losing my peace over what God is losing his peace over. You know what? I, you know, this is a little probably more transparent than I should go. But you know what I lose my peace over sometimes when I watch TV? All the political stuff. Man, I'm ticked. I'm absolutely ticked. Those sort of stuff I say, I can't go down that road very far because you're a mixed group, okay? I got, I got right and I got left, and I want to keep it, you know. But I, I got this button that if it gets pushed, I can get ticked. And, and I say, oh, this should happen, you know, and that should happen, and oh, this is our problem right over here. You know, if Jesus showed up, if Jesus showed up today in body, I don't think he would probably go to the Republican Party and confront it. I don't think he would go to the Democratic Party and confront it. I don't, think, I don't think he would confront ABC, CBS, NBC, or CNN. Well, maybe CNN. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Or Vox. I'm going to throw Vox in there, too. I don't think he would confront any of it. You know where, you know where he'd go? You know where he would go? Right here. And he would talk about how we're not calling sin what he calls sin. But he wouldn't stop there. You know what else he'd say? And you're not helping the people I've called you to help. What are you doing for the poor and the hurting and the defenseless? He would come to the church. Are you with me this morning? I remember... Man, I'm, sh I'm sure con conveying all our dirty laundry. We really do have a great church. <laughs> Many years ago, we had a, a, very, a very popular pastor who, uh, you know, just to say what it was, embezzled some money. We didn't call it that then, but that's what it was. About a thousand bucks. Very popular pastor. And uh, it really took the wind out of our sails. That pastor ultimately ended up leaving. I, you know, I brought some discipline to it and, and uh, didn't make this person go, but after the discipline realized that, man, a lot of trust had been broken, and, and so they, rightly so, uh, decided themselves, man, it, it's time to go. It really took the wind out of our sails. It's probably the first time we ever lost our momentum because of a storm, because this pastor was unbelievably well-liked. And I remember during the middle of all that, um, our growth had stopped. We had started declining. Some people left because this pastor left. And I was having lunch with the vice chair at Fuddruckers. You guys remember Fuddruckers? Over by uh, Lake, Lakeside. Lakeside. And, uh, and I was lamenting, pouring out all my woes. I mean, you never want to be the vice chair of this church. <laughs> That's who I kind of on. David knows. And... Uh, the vice chair at the time was John Cannon. And, uh, and I remember saying this. Has this ever happened to you? You ever say something that as soon as it left your lips, you kind of wanted, come back, please come back. You know, you wanted to kind of put the words back in. Have you ever done that? And I turned to John and I said, man, John, if we just would have pushed this under the carpet, we'd be running 500 by now. And as soon as it left my lips, said, come back, please come back, come back in, you know. Because, the, man, the Holy Spirit, bingo, you know. And I, and I quickly followed it up, and I said this, but, John, I'd rather be running 300 and clean than 500 and dirty. Amen. And that's when, through discipline, the Lord taught me there's a few things more important than success. And one of them is righteousness, integrity, and holiness. That... That lesson I have never forgot, and it came through discipline that I needed. Are you with me? Are we ready for number? Last, last lesson we can learn from this, these two verses. We see the retribution for sin. We see the retribution for sin. Look at the last phrase of verse 2. And put out of your fellowship. Listen, this sounds harsh. This sounds harsh. Put out of your fellowship the man who did this. Whoa. Put out of your fellowship the man. That sounds very, very harsh, doesn't it? I want you to keep one thing in mind. No matter 
What kind of discipline comes down? If it's Christian discipline, it never comes out of a heart of hate. Even though it's harsh. It never comes out of a heart of hate. It always comes out of a heart of love. It always comes out of an intent to be redemptive. Do you know why this has to be so harsh? For two reasons. One, sin is addictive. Any form of sin is addictive. It doesn't stay in its place. It grows until it controls you. We lost a a very prominent member of our church, one of my closest friends I've ever had in my whole life, left his wife and his son for a woman that he worked with. A very prominent uh, member of our church. It was so devastating to his family, to his wife, and to his son. I'm I'm, I'm confident his wife didn't even know fully who she was after that at least not in Roanoke, because her identity was so wrapped up in being that guy's wife. Um, The son was devastated. He was in ministry. Uh, He grew up in our church. He was one of my guys. And it so devastated him, he he knew, he knew right away he had to go for some professional counseling. And as he went, his counselor, as he listened to the story unfold, The counselor told him something I'll never forget. He he told it to me, and I've never forgotten it. He said, he he called this uh, young man by name and said that when a man crosses this line of sexual immorality into an adulterous relationship, he says for that man, it it is as addictive as heroin to a drug addict. Now you think about that. I don't know of any drug that's more addictive than heroin. And you know the, the withdrawal systems, the fight somebody has to put up with to get off of heroin. This guy says that when a man crosses the line, crosses a fence into an area he does not belong in terms of adulterous relationship, it is as addictive as heroin. So you can understand that the discipline that has to come has to be extreme to break that control. The other thing, the other reason why it has to be so extreme is because sin is not only addictive, it's contagious. It spreads. The most contagious uh, disease on record that that I found was swine flu. Little four-year-old kid comes up with swine flu in a remote village in East Mexico, uh, La Gloria. Within months, 60% of the village comes down with swine swine flu. They they quarantine it for a whole year. And they call this jumping. I don't know how it works, but even because, even, even with the quarantine, the swine flu jumped, somehow got over the the quarantine, and a man in Southern California somehow attracted it uh, a year later in April, the first part of April 2010. Somehow this man, I don't know if he was traveling in that area or what, he came down with that swoop. By the end of the month, i got to write this down. I'll read this because I'll, I'll forget one of them. By the end of that month, by the end of the month, that swine flu had spread to Spain, Israel, New Zealand, Austria, Germany, the United Kingdom, and Switzerland. This swine flu that started with a little kid in an extreme remote village in East Mexico went on to kill 2,203,000 people. Sin is more contagious than that. Have you ever seen a domino thing where somebody hits a domino and it starts a chain reaction? Have you ever seen that? The largest, I don't know if at least to that point, to that date, on November 15th, uh, 2008, on domino day, they set up 4,500,000 dominoes. It was the largest display at that time in history. It took 100 builders, listen to this, 100 builders, eight hours a day for three months to build it. It had the largest, it incorporated 51 different interlocks. 
It had the longest domino spiral, the, the highest domino climb, the longest domino wall, the largest domino structure, the largest number of dominoes resting on a single domino, 727. I don't know how they did that. The largest rectangle level domino field, 1 million uh, dominoes. It was the largest spill. Watch this. Saturday, November 15, 2008, at 2.52 p.m., Alex Santos knocked down the first domino. At 3.04, less than 14 minutes later, 4 million, of the 4,500,000, 4,345,027 dominoes fell in less than 14 minutes. Now think about that, 100 workers working eight hour days for three months to set up 51 interlocking uh, projects. It all crumbled in less than 14 minutes and at the end of the day, it left nothing but a big mess. That's what sin is like. And somebody in this room is contemplating crossing a line. Somebody in this room has already crossed the line. The domino has already fallen. And you are in desperate need of discipline. I am praying that this morning is an intercession for you. Run, don't walk. Run to a pastor or a good friend and confess. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You are the best there is. Go get them. You're dismissed.